Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We believe at Deep Adventure Ministries that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. Be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're saying at the intro that we believe the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wildness of God's will. And for you... Uh, for Timothy McCormick out there, my high school buddy, that doesn't mean uh, playing golf in the rough, Tim, like where you like to stay. If anybody's seen our TV show Long Ride Home, Tim always ends up in the rough. It doesn't mean playing. That's not the wild. Uh, it might be radical, but it's not, it's not the wild adventure we're talking about. We're talking about just that freedom <laughs> of just giving all that we are to the Lord and getting to watch him getting to watch him in action, getting to see what he's up to. Sometimes it takes a lot of patience. A lot of times it does, but it, there's nothing more fun than being right in the middle of God's will because then you get to see uh, God move. You know, I always say the Catholic Church is the thinking man's religion. Fide et ratio, faith and reason, faith seeking understanding. So I was thinking, who is the smartest, most intelligent, most gifted person I could have on my show? And I thought, I decided instead I would choose Mike Aquilina. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Mike Aquilina, our, our most frequent guest on the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me back, Bear. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how have you survived the winter? Is it, is it, is it spring? Now, we, we, this is a recorded show, but you're just coming out of your winter season there, aren't you? I don't know how cold it is there right now. Yes. Right now, uh, uh, the, the temperature just shot up this afternoon. So I was wearing a sweater this morning. And I had to change my clothes in the afternoon because it's so so warm now. Is so. it a fake? Is it a fake spring or is it the real spring or is it? What do you think? This one's looking real. I, a, I mean, I've seen snow as late as May first in Pittsburgh. Oh yeah. But uh, but I think this one's real. You know, here in Hawaii, May first is Lay Day. It's a, it's Lay Greeting Day. We drape all of our our, you know, the statues, all of our people that we we honor. So. Um, so, but this year we didn't have many lays. You know, I guess maybe next year we'll be able to get back to that. But you know, we 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 love Mike Aquilina, and uh, and we want to know what made what made you happen. So maybe you can give us a little bit of a back backstory. We, we always dig right into the early church fathers and and things like that. But can you? I'd like to hear more about your own faith journey, and then how you developed that interest, and then we'll dig deeper into what an early church father is and, and, and that. It's, as you know, if you're my most returning guest, it's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite subjects is, is the early church fathers. It, they brought me back to the Catholic Church, so it's, I see it very significant in my, my own life. So tell us, you know, give us the story. I mean, really go back to the beginning. You know, uh, were you raised in the Catholic Church, or how did that all happen? And I was. I was raised. I'm the youngest of seven children of my parents. Both my parents are very devout. Um, and uh, very committed to the faith. Uh, they made sure that all of us did all of our 12 years of schooling at Catholic schools, you know, so they paid for that even though we, we, we didn't have money. Um, uh, my father was a welder, uh, my mother was a garment worker, and, uh, and, and we were pretty poor, although we didn't know it at the time. Uh, we, it's just what, what we had, right? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we, we were we were immersed in the faith. Uh, my mother prayed the rosary all the time. You know, did, did my, you, some of did my you early... have, Did you have your own rosary? Did I? Now, I don't remember having my yeah. own rosary. What I do remember is um, from my earliest years, seeing my mother walk around the house with the rosary in her in one hand and a and a duster in the other. Praise okay? God. So, Praise so the Lord. Oh she'd be goodness. cleaning behind the radiators, those old time oh, radiators, goodness. right? Cleaning behind those while she was trying to get a rosary in. Uh, so, so I do remember my mother saying the rosary uh, quite often, all the time. Uh, we were regular mass goers. Uh, we were, we were always there on the holy days of obligation. My mm -hmm. mother 
went to mass every day and wow. during the school year i did too uh it was, mm. it was part of the 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 routine when i was in early years and then later on i i kept it going for some reason i don't know why but i did um i'd say that um with adolescence i was pretty typical in that i wanted to rebel uh against everything mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so uh so i i kind of uh stopped performing at school and I, uh, I, 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 I started breaking rules, you know? Uh, so, so that's, Did you get uh, in trouble with mother superior? Uh, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> I was pretty wily though. And I usually knew how to get ah, out of it. Um, okay. so, so, so yeah, I mean, uh, I'd say through high school and, uh, and then into college, I was not practicing the faith, uh, and there were there were a lot of reasons for that. Uh, my high school was run by a religious order, and and the sisters were really great. They uh, they taught us the faith, and um, and and they did they they taught us all the academics very well too. Um, uh, we started to get um, so it was a difficult time. Okay, these were the years after the Second Vatican Council, right after the '60s. Okay, and a lot of um, a lot of young women and middle-aged women were leaving the religious orders. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. Now the sisters were very kind, and and they uh, they hired a lot of them, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, and sometimes these people were not uh, teaching the faith. Oh, they were is. teaching okay. their 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 version. Yeah. yeah, and you know, yeah. I think that that there was a lot of confusion then too. Mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of people saw the changes that came about after the council, and they thought other things were just on the brink of changing. Okay, mm -hmm. so they were teaching those changes in advance of mm -hmm. of the the actual Before changes, they actually, and they actually That's, never happened. They were right, they yeah, actually yeah. never happened, and they never could happen. But right. anyway, uh, you know, uh, the faith as as uh, as we got it from them just seemed kind of silly. And 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 mm. I I just kind of withdrew because I thought eh, that's not making a lot of sense to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd rather do my thing. And and of course I had every every uh, every reason that I uh, that I well, want to what, go. What, what was your thing? Was was it was it pursuing other academics or was it just pursuing, you know, having fun or what do you mean by your thing? I think it was having fun. You know, mm. I mean it was going out drinking with my friends. Mm. You know, they do that in and, Pittsburgh, right? Uh, no, I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania. Oh, no, well, they, well, they, okay, they do that in Scranton then. <laughs> <laughs> I know they do that in Pennsylvania in general. That's my thought. They do. Know. They yeah. do. So we drank a lot of beer. Uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah, I, 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 stopped, I stopped practicing, and it, it really didn't have a lot of appeal to me. What was interesting is that, um, that I went away to college. I went to Penn State, and, again, I wasn't practicing the faith at that point. Uh, and they weren't teaching the faith per se in my mm -hmm. classes. Most mm -hmm. of my teachers were agnostic, some were atheist, uh, but they were teaching history mm. and they were teaching literature and they mm. were teaching art history in all of the humanities. And I started actually reading Catholic authors and reading about events that involved Catholics down what, what, through what history. Was the, what was the first couple Catholic authors that gave you traction? Do you remember? Hmm. Well, I remember the last one, <laughs> but yeah. but the first time I remember it was um was in um, art history class, mm. because almost all of the great scenes that we were analyzing were scenes that were painted by great Catholic artists, and they were scenes from scripture or scenes from the lives of the saints. So we were analyzing these in great detail. We had a professor who was not Catholic, but he was steeped in history and he had mm. devoted himself to the understanding of these great masters. Mm. So in order to get into the canvas, we had to get into the story that was behind it. And yes. he took us into those stories. So how far so back, how far back did that go? Did that go into the, the, the early, early days of the church or was it more during the Renaissance or what, 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 when did the, how far back did you go in those, that pursuit? It was a survey course. So all we the way back to the with, icons and forward. Like, even before, even primitive oh, art. Oh, we were studying primitive art. But what he loved, what this particular professor loved, was medieval art. Interesting. And so he spent a lot of time on the medieval artists, and he mm. helped us to understand Giotto and Duccio and Cimabue and all of these these great names from the Middle Ages. And, and he showed us their canvases. So we... um. Uh, 
well, you know, that, that, that brought me closer. And, uh, and I can remember I was taking a poetry class after that. And uh, one of the exercises we had in, uh, in the writing of poetry was to take a formal poem in another language and to translate it into an English form. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm not particularly good at languages, but I yeah. had taken a year of Latin in high school. So I figured, OK, I'll do something in Latin. And I got the Oxford Book of Latin Verse out of the library at Penn State, put it down on my desk in the dorm room, and I opened to a random page and I said, I'll translate what, what's ever on that page. I did it. And it was the Adoro Te Devote of St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> okay, so we got to take a break. We got to take a yeah. break, Thomas. Uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas is going to have to wait for us. <laughs> St. Thomas was 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 was, the, was uh, on your was was tracking you even back then. <laughs> I think so. We're talking with Mike Aquilina. Our, our by far our most uh, often we have a more often on our show than anybody else. And we're so glad to have him. We're going to go a little bit deeper into what, what makes Mike Aquilina happen. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the early church fathers. We want, want to remind everybody, all you mama bears out there, and we love the mama bears. Every mama bear that joins, they get this mama bear motorcycle uh, little teddy bear. We love the mama bears, not because they're sweet and cuddly and nice. It's because they're vicious. They're ferocious. They, I, I, if you've ever been to Montana, where I'm going to be going again here in a couple of weeks, the mama bears there are nothing to be messed with. And our mama bears, <laughs> who are part of our ministry, they love their family. They're protective of their family. They're praying for their family. And we want you to go to deepadventure.com and find out how you can become a mama bear. We'll be right back with more with Mike Aquilina. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Daniel the Boom Markham with another episode of Country Up, God's Humor. God just might have a sense of humor. I believe the scriptures show us as much. Some of you are thinking, that's the darndest thing to say. Even sacrilegious. Be careful there, boy. Well, just look at his creation. Take a gander at the spiny lump sucker or the fried-eyed jellyfish or the naked mole rat or the red-lipped batfish. Funny as gold darn looking critters. Makes you smile just calling them by their names, you old spiny lump sucker, you. There's a time Mary with chutzpah only a Jewish mama could muster. Verbally waved her hand with confidence at the wedding servants. Do whatever he tells you. Moving Jesus to conduct his first miracle, unplanned as it was. Never underestimate the power of a mama. Take the time after the resurrection when Jesus appeared to his boys on the Sea of Galilee. Advise a more careful run at John 21. Instead of dramatic like on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus casually cooking breakfast on the beach, saunters out of the shoreline fog, nonchalantly calling out to his boys, Lads, have you caught anything? Having been skunked after fishing all night, Jesus directs, Boys, put the net on the other side of the boat. The light goes on as John recognizes this is a repeat when his fishing buds and he were first called by Jesus. He shouts out, it's the Lord. Completely in character, Peter leaps out of the boat and swims to Jesus, leaving his fishing partners to slowly drag the massive catch ashore. Jesus set the boys up. Do you think maybe, just maybe Jesus was smiling, if not laughing at Peter hightailing it from ship to shore? He's got to have a sense of humor. After all, he created you. Funnier yet, he created me. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak Adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach without your help. You can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry 
by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite the men to go to, bear, to deepadventure.com and become a member of Bear's Man Cave. It's a secret Facebook group, but you can't join it uh, by going to uh, Facebook. You have to go to deepadventure.com and join. But we have a secret Facebook group. We, we talk, converse with each other uh, on an ongoing basis. We challenge and encourage each other um, and pray for each other and, and inspire each other. And every couple of weeks we have a Zoom video meetup, and it's become really a powerful way for men who want to go deeper with the Lord no matter where you are with the Lord, it's a great place for you to meet other men that want to do the same and to kind of develop and grow who you are as a Christian and help you. We also have the goal of helping you launch your own ministry. And so go to deepadventure.com, become a member of Bears Man Cave, and, uh, and uh, join the pack. We have our most frequent returning guest, Mike Aquilina. He's, so smart. he's pretty smart, but he's not so smart as to say no when I write to him. Say, will you be our guest again? <laughs> but Mike's been telling us about Thomas Aquinas, the very first real uh, Catholic author that you recall, that you bumped into, uh, was Thomas Aquinas. You bumped into him in a library, opening up a book that you needed to read and translate from Latin into English? Yes, yes, yes. I want and to hear I, the translation. Oh, no, I don't have it anywhere. <laughs> and I'm sure it was so bad that you don't want to hear it. Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote a good one. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, but, I, uh, but I did go through the process, and in the, in the process of translating, you have to really get into the reading of the poem. And, 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 you know, it crystallized a lot of things for me. You know, at that, um, at that time, I had been in college for, you know, a few years, and, and I'd and been still, taking and, in. And still a freshman? No, I'm not a freshman at that point. <laughs> in some ways, I still am now. But uh, yeah. but but well, my um, freshman year was the best five years of my life. So um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, so you're you're well into your education and you're studying Thomas Aquinas. I apologize. Yeah. I let you talk. No, no, that's okay. And uh, and and so I um, I did the translation, and I you know I think that in some ways, by the time I got through that translation assignment, I I, I was back in a sense. You know, mm. I kind of got the Catholic faith as it was rather than as I had had it mediated through the 1960s. You know, it, it, mm. I saw it. I saw it in its reality in its historical heft, really. And um, and uh, and it was attractive to me. Now, I didn't start practicing the faith, of course, because I'm that kind of a slug. You know, I didn't I didn't respond immediately. Uh, but I, I think that that made me ready in a lot of ways. Uh, it would be a few years. I, I think, um, you know, in the meantime, I got I got married. Um, my, my, my wife and I got got married in 1985. Um, we were married for a little bit, you know, maybe even for about a year when I decided to go back to confession and go to mass. I, I just started one weekend well what did and, you tell him uh, in confession we want to know no i'm just kidding we <laughs> but you but that, it's that funny was, yeah, go ahead i'm sorry it's funny i did get a curmudgeon in the confessional booth that day <laughs> well you know um it's the it is the way for people to come back is to go to confession yeah 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 it is it is and uh you know and he was a little grumpy and uh, a little irritated <laughs> with me for being away for as long as i was when you give him the number of years you it's been since your last confession uh but that's okay you know i'm i'm, I'm all right with that it's I, the way, I was it's the, i was ready it's a, it's the way back it really it is. is the way back and i know i know they the, the the confessor thomas aquinas confessor said his last confession he said was like the confession of a little child <laughs> like he was yes. so pure I, yes yes 
Unlike well, you that and me. one that one wasn't like the confession of a little <laughs> child, but but it did it did the job. It got me back, and you know I was I went back to uh, went back to mass the next day, and I continued going back. So um, so that's kind of how I landed there, and um, you know that's that I guess is is my story. Well, um, yeah, I, but, I, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Uh, go ahead. I was working in the publishing uh, business already at that time. No kidding. Uh, I started working for a publishing house my junior year in college, and uh, they I had an internship, and they hired me to stay on. And by the time I graduated, I was actually the editorial director of the house. Um, so I wow. graduated into at least a good title, if not if not yeah. a well paying job. Right, right, right. Uh, and uh, and and I was kind of off and running. So I, I was in the field that I would spend the rest of my days in at least so far that's where I've been working well, if you if you could see the video version of the show which by the way you can subscribe to at deepadventure.com you would see whenever we interview Mike he, he, he's surrounded by bookcases that's not that's not like a green screen right that's the no. real thing <laughs> that's the real because I could see you've got the commentaries on scriptures from the early church fathers on one side and and gee a whole row of, of my books on one side oh no those are probably yours how many books have you re- written by the way uh, maybe about sixty-five. Okay, so you you know it's not bad for a rookie getting going. Not bad. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so then then what 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 began to lead you into the church fathers? Hmm. Boy, uh, you know when I was a little kid, I remember reading about the discovery of Troy by Heinrich Schliemann. Okay, this is what we did in the years before Indiana Jones. <laughs> we read <laughs> we read books about oh, archaeology uh, and yeah. got excited. Yeah, my mom loved archaeology. Yeah. And so my parents saw that I liked that. They used to buy me books about archaeology. And I remember one had the 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 death mask of Agamemnon on the cover, you know? So you you're reading these things about about the great discoveries, right? That that these archaeologists had found from the ancient world. So it was kind of my dream to 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 become one of those. I see you. I see you doing that. You gotta get one of those hats. <laughs> I'll go with you. I'll be your I'll be your Let's go. I'll, Talk I'll about slap deep things adventure. for you. Yeah. <laughs> But archaeology is history. I mean, that, that, yes. I mean they, yeah. I know, like, whenever you read a history book, I mean, not not the comic book kind that I read, but when you read history, there's often references to coin. We found a coin, right? Yes. Right. And it had right. these dates and that, and we was in this level, so they know that what, what was happening at the time so much just by finding coins in archaeological digs. That's right. That's right. So I had that kind of fascination. Uh, and uh, then I, you know, as I got older, you find out that archaeologists actually work very hard, and it's pretty boring work. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Sit there with a toothbrush. <laughs> I was know, watching an hour, hours on end. I was watching an hour half documentary last night on people doing just that. You know, so I, yeah. I dig it too. I dig, they're just, and it's usually uh, student assistants, right, or archaeologists. And it's the most uncomfortable position, and it's hot, and you yes. got a little bitty bitty toothbrush. Yeah, I watched a ninety minute. I don't know if you call that an action film, but it was a documentary, and they were that's what they were doing the whole the whole time. But yeah, so, so was, you found out you didn't really want to do that. That's right. That's right. So I figured I'd do my digging in books, and I, I'm a history buff, and I yeah. started digging. And as I got more and more interested in my Catholic faith, I got interested in uh, Christian origins. You know, you want to know where did we come from. Why do we do the things we do? What's the explanation mm-hmm. for this? Uh, what 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 are my ancestors are about? It's a it's the same impulse I think that drives us to spend as much money as we do, we Americans, on genealogy. Mm-hmm. You know, all mm-hmm. of these these ancestry um, websites that people can go into, search databases, and try to find out where where did I come from, what makes me what I am. And I think that's that's the same impulse that was behind my interest in the fathers. I wanted to know where we came from. I wanted to know, um, you know, what made us what we are. So uh, I can remember two early authors I read were actually fairly late in the patristic game, but they were Augustine and Chrysostom, and they mm-hmm. struck me because both of them were so poetic yes. in their descriptions of the Eucharist, especially mm. in the liturgy. Mm-hmm. And I said, wow, you know, they were describing the the reality uh, of his presence 
at that time and in it's such a, vivid terms. Yeah, and it's the same, you know, like reading, they're describing what's happening at Mass that you go to every day. It's not like it's the franchise has changed and now they're offering fries instead of just, you know. <laughs> I mean, the Catholic Church, it, it, it's pretty much the same, right? You read Justin Martyr. And yes. It's, yeah, it's like it ha- we, and that's the beauty of it. Yes. Is that is that the truth is truth is truth and it's been sustained through all this time. And you find Augustine and you find uh, Chrysostom. I've tried, I've read, it, it, his name means honey tongue. Is that what it means? I forget what his name is. Golden means. tongue. Golden, Golden tongue. tongue. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and you, you see that they're in love with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing beautiful minds. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So, so, um, you know, when I when I was young, when I when I was growing up, I grew up in a in neighborhood uh, that was Italian. As a matter of fact, the, all the residents, the families, really came from three villages in Sicily. No so kidding. everybody was Catholic. Okay, oh, everybody yeah. was Catholic, yeah. and everybody was the same kind of Catholic. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I went to college, and everybody wasn't Catholic. You know, uh-huh. lots of people were lots of different things, and a lot of them didn't believe in anything. Well, we got so, we got to uh, take a break, Mike. We got to take a break. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna talk a little bit about Mike's Sicilian background, <laughs> and you know the 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 rude awakening when he showed up showed up at college. This is the Bear Wastic Adventure. We'll yeah. be right back with more. This is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach with a deep adventure moment. I remember when I first learned to scuba dive, I I was like a little kid. I was so excited. Uh, A friend of mine took me out, went right into the ocean, started teaching me in the shallow part of the reef. The third dive, he took me down 120 feet. And I was so thrilled because when you scuba dive, you're living in a three-dimensional space, like a bird, you know? Like when I learned to fly like a little Cessna, you're in a three-dimensional space. You feel it when you're in a little airplane. Or when you skydive and you're under the canopy, you know, you feel the sense of being in a three-dimensional space. It never felt so alive and so great. But when I scuba dived, I went down 125 feet, and I was thinking, this is great. I was seeing sharks and barracuda and really scary-looking eels, and I was thinking, I'm going to get a really great aerobic workout while I'm down here. Uh, so I'm swimming hard and enjoying everything. And then, then I, uh, my scuba instructor came over and he checked my tank and he looked at me and he kind of cautioned me to be careful, watch my tank. And I realized then you don't go out with a scuba tank and get an aerobic workout because you're going to lose all of your oxygen. So I tried to calm down, but I couldn't. I was so excited. And then he came over to me again. His name is Guy, by the way. He, sir, he teaches uh, diving in Vietnam now, I think. He looked at my tank, he said, this is not good. So he had me take off my tank and he took off his tank and we had to switch, which means there's a moment in time there when I won't have any oxygen and I have to do a good job of clearing my mask in order to take that slow descent up with very little oxygen. So we made the switch. This is what Jesus did for us, scuba tank theology. Jesus dove down deep into the depth of our lives and the depth of our spirit and he's offering you oxygen. Why wouldn't you take it when you're that deep? Receive the breath of the Holy Spirit. Receive the fresh oxygen from Jesus. This is Bear Wozniak with a Deep Adventure Moment. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Yes, we mean you. Go to deepadventure.com and check out Bears Man Cave, a men's only Facebook group. Join the pack with other men as they challenge and inspire one another to manly virtue. Plus, you can dialogue with us in our regular video chat meetups. Plus, get your exclusive content. 
join at deepadventure.com. That's deepadventure.com. Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak. We want to invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and become part of the pack. You can, if you press the subscribe button, uh, you get our weekly email newsletter. It, it, it comes to you with the video version of that week's uh, show. So if you want to, a lot of people miss the first half or they, or, or they miss it completely, you can get it sent to you in the morning and then you get a video version of the show. So, And also, if you, go, if you subscribe, you get a free audio download of my most recent book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. We have Mike Aquilina with us today. So, yeah, so you were raised kind of in a cocoon, right, of, of this Catholic incubation. Then you go to school and you find out there's a lot of different types of Catholics and right. a lot of different types of people. Right. And as I said before, I wasn't really practicing the faith at that time. But when people would say things like I, I'd met evangelicals for the first time. Yeah. And when people would say things like, well, Catholics worship Mary. I, I'd say, that's not true because <laughs> yeah. I knew it wasn't true. I'm, I, you know, I grew up a Catholic. So even though I wasn't practicing it, I knew that these urban legends I was hearing about Catholicism just were not true. Well, later on, as I started to get into the church fathers, I found out that none of those urban legends are true, that the church fathers were practicing the same faith that was practiced at Catholic parishes, you know, in my day. Um, they, they were practicing that same faith back in 107 AD. Isn't it amazing? 67 AD. You know, yeah. that the, the faith of the apostles was the faith as it was practiced in my little Italian parish in northeastern Pennsylvania. And that that was interesting to me it was attractive to me um so i um I, I i really got into the fathers for all of those reasons it it's um it was a connection i had um the other thing that i could see about the fathers is that they were as intensely interested in scripture as my evangelical friends were you know my mm -hmm. evangelical friends were saying that they took the scripture as their only authority but uh, you know I'd, i'm able now to point out well, wait a minute. Let's look at the way the first Christians interpreted those same scriptures. Amen. And the, yes, yes. The, the Christians of the second generation and third generation. There's a certain consistency across time. The fathers had it. And they it. battled for it. They battled for it. You know, I, I went to Baylor University, so I had was around a lot of great Protestant Christians there. Yeah. And I had my conversion in, in the charismatic renewal uh, to go deeper in my faith as a Catholic. But... But I remember I met someone there that said I, he was studying patristics, and I go like, "Well, what's that?" And he described it to me. And I go, "Well, that sounds boring." You know, I, di I didn't get it. I, but as you know, uh, reading the early church fathers is what brought brought me back to the church. Um, to uh, what, what's a good book for people? What which one or two of your books would help people kind of get traction in their study of the fathers? Would, I know you love all of them; they're all your babies. But which one? Which one would give someone a traction who's curious about how, how to get a basic understanding? Well, I think the best place to start is The Apostles and Their Times, if you want one of my books. The Apostles and Their Times, because that's the pivotal generation. Right. What I show in that book is how the apostles pass the faith on to the next generation and how that same faith, faith was manifest in that generation. So you can see it happening. You can see the handing on of the baton, so to speak. I, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. What's, what's another one? Uh, the second one would be the fathers of the church, because okay. that pit starts with that ge same generation, but takes it forward until about the year 750. Uh, so those two books. I mean, I remember when I found the early church fathers, it was it was Justin Martyr who turned it for me. As I, and that was one of the earliest ones. And I thought, he's describing the same church I grew up in, basically. And if that's how the early church believed... Then that's then I need to get back to the Catholic Church, you know. It, yes, yes. What do you What do you want to say? I see you're cracking up, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I thought it was so cool back in 1992, when the Church um, published the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I love that. You know, book. I'm going through it, and you get to that chapter on the Eucharist, and it's called the Mass of All Ages. And it's footnote, right? footnote, 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 right? Yes. And, and who it's are it's all Ignatius of Antioch. <laughs> And Justin Martyr, and yeah. it's from you know these sources from 107 A.D. and 150 Praise A.D. Praise God! You know, yeah. it's it's amazing. And I yeah. thought it was so funny. They have a description of the mass, a description of the mass yes. in that section, and it's by Justin Martyr, and they're describing the mass at my parish. 
But really, these are words from 150 AD. Right. So I'm thinking by someone who I, died who died for for his apologetic to the emperor. Right. That's right. I mean, well, he kind right. of took it. It wasn't like he just made it up for the sake of nothing. He was willing to die to have that communicated. That's right. And a brilliant intellectual. He was a philosopher. Okay. Who founded I want a successful school so, of philosophy in Rome. Well, I want to talk about that. We started off the show talking about fide et ratio, faith and reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This beautiful Greek connection, you know, i got to say, um, around the year 500 AD, there was Socrates, that, that period of Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. There was even a very wise person, Confucius, in the East, right? A different, totally different thing. But, and then there was the wisdom writings of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, um, the, the, the Hebrew people that isn't yeah. included in, in, in the Protestant Bible. But there was this moment in time as if the Lord just infused the ability to think, you know, and, and that, that Greek uh, understanding of, of reason uh, helped us to properly, un ability to really discern and understand the revelation of Scripture. It's like fide et ratio, faith and reason, the two wings. They, they, they go hand in hand because God gave us a brain for a reason. <laughs> and come let us reason together, he says. And I want to know, you know, when I read the early church fathers, I fall more in love with God because I know him better because they knew him, not just in their hearts, but in their minds. There was this, this clarity, this understanding. So tell us about the Greek connection that so many of the early church fathers like Clement of Alexandria, for example, the some of the early church fathers. How, how, what was that? How, how did how did that connection help um, bring to light the scriptures to help us to really understand the scriptures? Well, I agree with you that you know in those centuries right before the the coming of our Lord in the flesh, um, there there were all of these providential movements. You could see yeah. God working in specific ways. Um, for example, the, the the rise of the Roman Empire. Okay, and right. suddenly there's a system of roads all around the earth. Why? So that the apostles could take the gospel out on the roads. Um, around the same time, you find the discovery of the trade winds. So for the first time in history mariners could sail on the open sea and get to the far ends of the earth and they opened up a lot the, quicker yeah and the pathway to the east they began to travel around the horn or, or horn or there was a way to india yes uh, you know and then on to china and so there were, but there was a kind of a, a preparation in a sense of the mind to hear the gospel with, with the, the yes. mythological uh soap opera <laughs> began to make yes. less and less sense to people and right. the, and but but Christianity did. Of right. Course it takes what a leap we find there, as you said, uh, four hundred years, five hundred years before the coming of our Savior, especially in Greece, was the refinement of a language for talking about spiritual matters and about intellectual of matters. There was a um, the Greeks were able to bring la language to a level of abstraction that 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 had not been before. And what we find in, in the great figures uh, like those you've mentioned, uh, Clement of Alexandria, wow, Origen, all of these, these brilliant minds um, had been raised on the language of, of Plato and Aristotle. And they were able to use those concepts in order to understand what just happened. Okay, yeah. because there's this event that just happened. Three persons, happened. one one yes. nature. What the heck? How do you describe? How do you explain that? Right, things like or, that. Or the the finite containing the infinite in the uh, with the advent of our Lord, the incarnation. How do you begin to talk about these things? So what we find is that is that they used the language that they had inherited from the Greeks uh, to understand. Uh, the doctrine of the incarnation, the doctrine of the Trinity, and so on. Um, uh, at the same time, they had to take it to the next level to understand the things that Jesus was talking about, because uh, uh, he breaks all the molds. You know, he mm. he breaks the wine skins. Uh, Amen. Um, and uh, and and that's that's what happened. And, so and for the we we got to take a quick break. I was just going to say, and so, <laughs> and so and so you know, you look at that. Oh, the Greek, you know, like like it was Jerome said, what is what is what does Rome have to do with uh, Athens? A lot or Jerusalem has to do with Athens. That turns out quite a lot. But the the uh, the, the people. Oh, well, why are they talking about Greek thinking and Greek thought? Well, maybe the New Testament was pretty much written in Greek. 
you know, because of the, the refinement of that language. When we get back, I'm going to ask you the difference between homo usius and homo eusius. Does one was done, one little iota might matter. We'll be right back yeah. with Mike Aquilina. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Mike, where can they find you? Fathersofthechurch.com. I'm sure I keep forgetting to ask that. Fathersofthechurch.com. If you're a Catholic, you need to have Mike Aquilina in your quiver. You need to read his books, and uh, it'll so deepen your faith, and, and, and your, you find your heart being enlarged. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Mahalo for your kokua in supporting us. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to you, our listeners, for supporting the Bear Wozniak adventure radio show at deepadventure.com. We would not be able to bring you our radio show with its uniquely powerful and gritty outreach Without your help, you can become part of our pack. You can support our ministry by going to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak or by just going to deepadventure.com and clicking on the Patreon link and become a part of our outreach. That's deepadventure.com. Once again, mahalo for your kokua. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Our most returning guest, Mike Aquilina. Every time I do a round of interviews, I always call Mike and he goes, what are we gonna talk about? And I go, I don't know, we'll figure it out. But, you're, but we're talking about the connection uh, to the, uh, uh, most of the early church fathers had some connection to, the, to Greek thinking and to understanding. They probably read uh, the, cl the Greek classics. Am I wrong in saying that or? No, no, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, Tertullian, the guy who said, what has Athens oh, to do Oh, it was Tertullian. It wasn't it was. I'm sorry. And, and, <laughs> okay. and, and, and it's, it's, it's hard to see. Um, you know, he, he was probably being a little bit ironic, at least I hope, because he had received <laughs> a deep education in the pagan classics, okay? Right. It was the pagan classics that had trained him to talk the way he did, to use the rhetoric that 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 made him so successful. To know how to write, to know how, to know how to write, to know how to communicate right. a point, uh, to make a, to syllogize and yes. and go from point A to point B. Right. That what didn't exist without the Greeks. That's right. So he 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 did learn he did learn an awful lot about uh, about about philosophy about rhetoric um, from the from the pagan classics. Um, so uh, so and that's true of a lot of the fathers, especially in those early years. So many of them were converts. Well, they we didn't knew come from Christian homes. We knew Paul knew the classics. He quoted them when he was in Athens. Right? Yeah, that's he right. Was, and 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 so the, so to throw out the Greek thinking element to the early church fathers, uh, as I think some of our Protestant brothers and sisters might be inclined to do, would be a big mistake. Um, it would. Yeah. It, that, that, it was like as if the Lord said, let me give them this skill set, this ability to think and reason and verbalize, communicate, 
and then we're going to give him revelation and then run wild. You know, let us let us. Go ahead. It was imp as important as the roads, you know, and, the, and the and the trade winds and all yeah. of these other things that 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 enabled the gospel to be taken to the ends of the earth. That was his command: take it to the ends of the earth. But that presumed all of these other providential incidents that had um, that had uh, had given the apostles the the ability to fulfill the command. Okay. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, I have these all these volumes of the early church fathers of the church fathers, yeah. pre Nicene, yeah. post Nicene. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what, what, when did they start? When did it start? When did it end? And what did it take to be considered to be put in that that is that the, the, one of those books? What does it what does it take to be called a father of the church? Hmm. Well, um, uh, the, the 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 era of the fathers really starts. Um, with the generation after the the apostles okay so it starts in the first century and it continues to about the eighth century and we find already in those early years a great interest in the saints who had gone before the martyrs were remembered at the liturgy and we 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 celebrated their their feast day the anniversary of their death every year this is something that was happening already in the 100s so there was a there was a concern about preserving the tradition that had been hand, handed down to us so when we get to the 100s we have a great figure like Irenaeus who's already talking about the ancient faith all right mm -hmm. he learned the faith from polycarp who learned it from St. John himself, the apostle. Right, and, and so, was a contemporary then, to some degree, of, right. of Polycarp. And we and so so some of the early church, or Polycarp was an early church father, right? Wasn't he? An, yes. So he was yes. a contemporary of, of one of the apostles, right? He was met. That's right. So, yeah, and a and, disciple of him. And, and Irenaeus is all over there in France, or Gaul, as they called it in those days. And he's, yeah. and, and he's already giving great uh, humility towards Rome, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'm interrupted you again. Go ahead. <laughs> I get excited. <laughs> no, no, no. I I get excited too because what we find already then is that the fathers themselves were interested in the fathers who had gone before them. Mm. So in the in the one hundreds, there's this guy Julius Africanus. Okay, and Julius is a historian. Well, what does he do? He goes to the Holy Land because he wants to visit those villages and talk to the people who lived there about. Jesus Christ and about the apostles and about the culture there about the 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 descendants of King David and he wrote it all down because mm -hmm. he was concerned that the 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 teachings of the fathers be preserved mm. and this develops down through the ages Eusebius does the same thing in the in the 200s and 300s his his life um spanned but you know both centuries and then after him, Jerome also uh, wrote a biographical dictionary because he wanted to preserve the teachings of the fathers. Well, by the time you get to the fifth century, you find these great thinkers like Vincent um, of Larens uh, reflecting on the past and trying to figure out, well, what is it that makes someone a father rather than simply a writer? Because not every Christian writer was revered the way the fathers were. Not every mm -hmm. Christian writer was considered an authority. Mm -hmm. So Vincent proposed four marks of a father. One was holiness of life, okay? The second was orthodoxy in doctrine, right doctrine. The third was antiquity. They had to be from the early church. Right. And the fourth was church approval. The church had to give the thumbs up on that particular father's teaching. Um, so uh, so those who fulfilled those categories, uh, we call fathers. Um, now, there's no canonized list of fathers. So sometimes uh, scholars and churchmen will dispute about whether a particular figure should be called a father or simply an ecclesiastical writer. Like some guys really walked that fine line and got themselves Origin, into trouble. Origin, for example, or yeah. Origin, or Tertullian, or mm -hmm. Eusebius, or but Theodore great of thinkers. Great, they got, contributed so much, but they're not a saint, and they're not you know they're not the official teaching of the church, but powerful insight. That's and, right. And That's some right. detour. And some detours. 
<laughs> and some detours. We value their teaching. Uh, yeah. So people will dispute about whether they should be called fathers or not. Some scholars say they should be and some say they shouldn't be. Um, but we all have to encounter their writing and we all right. have to come to terms with it one way or another because right. they're giants. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I like the term ecclesiastical writer. That's a great way to kind of yeah, par yeah, kind yeah. of parse kind of parse them. And then so when does the patristic era end, would you say? When it was there, who who ends around it? 750 and it ends um with uh with the death of St. John of Damascus. Um we find a lot of significant things happening in the world at that time. The dark ages are setting in in Europe and the Muslim invasions Rome, Rome are happening. Has, Rome has fallen. The Muslim the the the, the Moors are are moving in. From all, That's right. from all directions. That's right. And so the world is changing. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a, not only a, a changing landscape out there, but also in here. Mm. Uh, people are turning to different ways of thinking. And with John of Damascus, we see the last of the fathers, but maybe also the first of the medievals, mm. because he's trying to synthesize all the work of the great fathers and give it a common voice. And it's that same trajectory, uh, you know, that we follow uh, to, to get to the work of St. Thomas Aquinas and the other great medievals as this is developing yeah. down through history. But they're, they're beyond. Yeah, I was going to do that synthesis, Mike, but I'm glad John, John of Damascus did it instead. <laughs> <laughs> Saves us a lot of work. <laughs> But but we we love them and isn't it interesting when you sit down to read like I I went through all of John Chrysostom's writings, I remember once I tried to sit down and read all of Augustine's that was the first one I fell in love Ooh, with, and I yeah. thought, and I was doing it online I didn't have the books yet right and I was doing it online yeah. I go, uh, maybe that's not such a good <laughs> idea, you know I read his I read his Republic and his Confessions and then it was, yeah that's just the tip of the iceberg, it, it's amazing how prolific they were. But um, but we we love our we love our early church fathers, and and then and then came the then, so now in this time in this place I think that Catholics, the Catholic Church can more more is more available, to those young atheists and agnostics or not necessarily young anymore. Who are discovering that the emperor isn't wearing any clothes, mm -hmm. that the Richard Dawkins Richard Dawkins of the world it just doesn't isn't stacking up. And mm -hmm. the new age people are becoming are realizing there's really no solution there when they when they really need to go to pr for prayer or consolation they're not going to find it. If they come to the Catholic Church, I don't have to start out by quoting them scripture. In other words, we can say let's reason together, let's talk together, and we can give them faith and scripture. But I know I was sitting at coffee once, and the guy I was with this guy walked by and go, "You guys, see you guys are reading the Bible." Uh, that's just a bunch of mythological garbledy book gook. I don't read that. And the guy who was with me, his response was to quote scripture to him. Hmm. Right? That's not going to work. Yeah. But, yeah. but to ask him a question, well, that's interesting. Why do you say that? Mm -hmm. And so those are, if you spend time in the Catholic, thank God for the Catholic catechism. The catechism um, and the early church fra fathers brought me roaring back. And yeah. read your catechism and spend time uh, with, with Mike's books. And so that when you have a dialogue with, with this, this generation who's lost their way, it's the Catholic Church that will bring them back. And remember, you don't have to be a great apologist. you just got to be a witness. I know the man. He loves you, has a great plan for your life, but you should be able to reason with them. Mike Wackelina, yeah. where can they find you again? Fathersofthechurch.com. Okay, you got 30 seconds to say whatever you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, the pressure's on. Hey, you know, you go back to the fathers and you learn how they converted the world. If we look at our world today, it seems daunting. Yes. So was the world then. And they succeeded. They overcame the pagans who were persecuting them to the death. They loved them, even as they were killing them. And they loved them into the church. And they changed the world for the better. A, a lot of what we love today, we have only because of the, the works of those early church fathers. We have to be grateful to that. We have to carry it forward to a new generation. Mike, that's exactly what I had in my heart this morning when I woke up. I was just praying mm -hmm. in, in, before I got out, even got out of bed. And I was thinking, we need to say to the people, uh, as dark as it seems now, and there seems to be this, this, this overshadowing kind of political thing that's that, that's coming against Christians or whatever we've been through that before 
Yes. And we've prevailed. Yes. And the early church Read shows, the fathers. And the early church shows us that. Mike Aquilina, aloha. Everybody, we love you guys. Go to uh, your website again, Mike. Fathersofthechurch.com. And then find out more about Mike. This is Bear Wozniak. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Hey, man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.